The Federal Bureau of Investigation said Wednesday that it continues to investigate the weekend cyber attack on JBS, revealing that the May 30 attack was the work of a Russian ransomware gang. The incident, which shut down nine beef plants across the United States, was the latest cyber attack on U.S. infrastructure and one of the first in the food production industry to gain widespread media attention. Welcome to Feedstuff's In Focus, our podcast taking a deeper look at big issues in the livestock, poultry, grain, and feed industries. I'm your host, Andy Vance. Thanks for joining us. This episode is sponsored by United Animal Health, a leader in animal health and nutrition. You can learn more about United Animal Health and how they're working to advance animal science worldwide by visiting the website unitedanh.com. While JBS said that production at all its JBS USA and Pilgrim's Pride facilities resumed Thursday, the incident highlights the potential vulnerabilities of our technologically advanced, digitally oriented food production and processing system. In this episode, we talk with Professor James Lowe, director of the iLearning Center at the University of Illinois' College of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Lowe says disruptions anywhere in the food animal supply chain cause major impacts up and down that chain. COVID-19 was the most recent major disruption to the meat industry, but Lowe says this cyber attack exposes another vulnerability in a highly mechanized industry. Dr. Lowe, before we get into the news of the day related to some cyber attacks now in the meat industry, I, I want to get a little context. Your your CV is is very interesting to me because you've been in private practice for a long time with some of the largest swine uh, integrated systems and, and uh, practices in the country but you're the director of what's called the iLearning Center at the University of Illinois College of Veterinary Medicine. What is the iLearning Center and and what's been your touch with this concept of cybersecurity, which has become a bigger and bigger topic in food animal production and processing? Well, Andy, yeah, I think some people might say I can't hold down a job, so maybe that's the better description of my CV. But uh, I joined the university six years ago um, and we started working in this online education space uh, pretty extensively from that point forward. And we've done a bunch of iterations over the year. And we ended up um, what we've called the iLearning Center internally, and that's our shop to develop and deliver uh, online programs for veterinarians and, and producers and um, you know the general community. And, and that's everything from a uh, from uh, one hour type uh, courses, quick hit stuff to uh, a whole online master's degree that we're really positioning across the globe to do, how do we transition, uh, how do we transfer, excuse me, data or information knowledge uh, globally or, or even within the US. And it's, we've kind of called it extension 2.0 uh, or 3.0. How, how do we reinvent the land grant institution's primary mission of disseminating knowledge, right? We have a tripartite mission. One of those is teaching, one of those is discovery, and the other one is, is service. And, and a big part of that education service gets blended together into this dissemination bit, which is really why the land grants were formed. And so uh, that's been the vision of the iLearning Center. Um, we've been quite fortunate. Campus has supported us uh, uh, fantastically well. The college has been very supportive. And so we're up now, we're running an online master's program uh, primarily for veterinarians, uh, really designed at how do we give them these skills to work in a in a new modern industry. And and I graduated uh, a, a long time ago in the mid '90s. And you know when I graduated, our typical client had three or four hundred sows and farrow to finish and um, row cropped and uh, really the classic kind of diversified farm and. Certainly, that's not the industry today on the beef or the or the pork side, right? Particularly in the feed yard side on beef, but a large integrated, uh, very specialized systems, obviously the same in row crop. And so we said, listen, uh, we got a lot of veterinarians, a lot of people working in these industries that that are take a very different set of skills than what we've traditionally taught uh, at the universities. And so, how do we disseminate? knowledge and, and really build skill sets for, for that group. And so that's, uh, that's what I kind of do every day. Part of that has become, obviously, uh, when you're online, we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we secure and protect and, and make the system work uh, every day when there are people out there in the world that don't want it to work every day. And that's become an interesting uh, bit. Um, my summary of that would be is if you think you're secure, you're probably not. And um, in spite of really Herculean efforts, uh, you know, by large organizations such as the university, 
you know, I think we have vulnerabilities every day. Uh, everything's there. It's accessible. And so if somebody wants to do it, they can get after it. I think it's one of the great threats to our current economic model of uh, really online, an online presence-based way of doing business. And, and so how do we solve those challenges? You know, there's a part of me that says, you know, our, our parents and grandparents who, who maybe uh, look a bit askance at, at all the technology in our lives today, maybe they're a little vindicated when we have these kind of stories uh, that, that come up in this JBS story and cyber attack that the FBI is now linked to a Russian ransomware gang, you know, still developing a bit and, and JBS says they're, they're back up and operating and want to talk more about the implications in a moment. But I'm thinking, you know, about your, your work in integrated food animal management systems. And when you talk about the evolution of your you know, swine industry clients as a veterinarian, uh, our, our new product tour at National Hog Farmer, we unveiled our uh, 11 new product tour entrants last week during the Global Hog Industry Virtual Conference. And more than half of them uh, were, were software-based products, right? So like this is a pretty important part of our food production system, not, not just at the processing end with the JBS example, but going back to that sow barn, how, how vulnerable do you think our food production system is given the level of technology, um, whether we're talking about cloud-based or, or just stuff that is, is touching the internet out there, how vulnerable are we in the big picture? Andy, I don't know how vulnerable we are. I do know that we are exceedingly dependent, right? We can't make systems work today in, in really any of the industries. Maybe the cattle boys are a little little ahead of the pig boys, but um, you know, we can't run a pig system today without without computers. Uh, like you can't drive your car without a computer, right? Whether it's six, eight, 10, 15 computers in the average car today. You know, we we can't run a a, a, a pig system. We can't make feed. Uh, we can't get bills paid, um, and, and you know it's down to you know pig system. We, you know all of our barns are computerized now to run the ventilation systems, and so they may not be hooked up to the internet, but electronics drive our life, uh, and so I think it's something we certainly have to think about. I mean, I we as we think about as I think about our discovery programs research side, you know a bunch of that work is. You know, we're all doing stuff that's electronic today. Again, as you said, half the product, new products in National Hog Farm are, are digital. Um, that's the space we spend a lot of time working in. We're saying, how do we integrate these things? How do we make the systems more efficient? And agriculture has been a laggard to that um, adoption compared to other industries, but we've gotten there. I don't know uh, any system that's, pig system has spent a lot of time talking about cybersecurity. Obviously, they think about it, but this incident should be kind of one of those uh, bellwethers, right? As you read the news, um, this group that did it said, oh, we're going to target the food system because we think it's vulnerable. We think it's easy. We think they'll pay a lot of money because it's sensitive. And so it should be a wake-up call to all of us that uh, we have to have systems that are integrated and in, in work. And we don't have good manual overrides a lot of times. I mean, the um, uh, obviously all the tractors today are, are pretty integrated to the internet, right? We don't drive tractors anymore. The tractors drive themselves, but there's a manual override. God forbid we have to go drive it and put the row marker down on the planter, but we could put the row marker down on the planter and go plant corn. You know, we can't run a feed mill that way. There isn't a manual on switch in the feed mill. It's, it's completely computerized. Everything works off a computer, always integrated to the internet because that's how we stuff push stuff back and forth. And so in the livestock industry is we've really tried to drive efficiency, minimize uh, people to drive, you know, productivity per person. Um, we're dependent. And I think that makes us extremely vulnerable. And, and I'm way out over my skis to talk about how do we fix that. But I think it's something strategically um, is, is I talk to owners and, and we think through that, that's something we're going to have to move up the chain, not just how do we make it more digitally efficient, how do we make it more digitally secure? Yeah. And, you know, you hit the nail on the head. We spent a lot of time up front talking about kind of the swine industry, maybe because that's, uh, well, certainly that's, that's your area of expertise in terms of private practice, but also one that I, I think of as maybe being the most kind of technologically integrated, all the reasons you described, but we could be talking about, you made the example of the feed mill, certainly our, our feed industry customers are acutely aware of all of the technology that's uh, at, at play there. Um, you know, we could be talking about the poultry space. Yeah, as you noted, beef cattle may be a little different. The dairy industry, certainly. Uh, do, do you think that 
when you're talking with uh, some of your 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 constituents, so, so to speak, out there and in, in the extension part of your mission, does the average producer out there, whether we're talking about at a sow farm, whether we're talking about at a dairy operation, whether we're talking about those row crop uh, producers, you're talking about, do, do they think about this on a regular basis? Is this like something that there's a general consciousness or, or awareness of this potential cyber vulnerabilities? Or is it one of those things that's, you know, still a bit out there because it's not on fire in front of us, like getting corn in the ground or getting sows farrowed or something that has, has a higher degree of urgency? Is it one of those things that people think, well, it, it won't happen to me? It'll happen to JBS, but it won't happen to me. Well, I think the discussion, when we talk about security, it's always been about privacy, that people don't want their data out. And, and those conversations occur routinely. I don't think there's been a tremendous amount of conversation around how do I protect my systems from you know ransomware or someone, a malicious actor shutting us down. I, I just It just hasn't been a conversation that, that I've been part of. And I, I'm, I'm sure the IT guys are having chats about it, but it's not been top of mind. And most of the time as I were in rural USA, eh, we're not that exciting. Uh, we're not that big a target. And so that's probably true. No one would view that uh, the average pig farmer or the average uh, cattle farmer, average feedlots, probably that big of a juicy target to get money out of from a criminal standpoint. But is that becomes easier to do, right? It's like uh, all things with technology, it gets easier every year. So if is hacking becomes easier, uh, you would think that uh, the targets will get smaller and smaller as more people get involved. And so it's not been a top of mind thing. I, I hope this JBS, uh, their un, really unfortunate experience helps all of us to think about, hey, how do we be a little better at that? Uh, what do our systems look like? How do we build redundancy? I think that's a big ticket. How do you build a manual redundancy or an electronic redundancy? that if somebody tries to do something, uh, we can make it work tomorrow. We can uh, turn the switch on and, uh, and still, uh, still feed pigs or, or uh, uh, ventilate the building or whatever. Yeah, and it's interesting too, because I think about this, you, you know, there's a buddy of mine who works in NIT and uh, has been involved in consulting. And he always says, my goal online is to make myself uh, as small a target as possible. You know, if I'm, I'm boring and uninteresting, they're not going to come for me. That's hard to do if you've got a thousand sales, 5,000 sales, whatever it is. Right. You know, so you might, you might look and say, uh, well, JBS is obviously a, a huge, big target, but that, that could be just sort of the tip of the spear to see, okay, how, how vulnerable is this industry? And, and can we get our hooks in there? How do we, how do we start having that conversation and thinking about ways to, to, to not because your your reaction might be well let's just figure out how to cut the cloud out of this right like let's figure out how to make these systems work without exposing ourselves but but that leaves all of those benefits that we can extract extract from these new software based uh, you know integrations that that we were talking about earlier our new product tour was great some really cool innovations uh, on the digital side of these operations how do we get ourselves into a place where we can feel secure and confident without saying just cut the hard line to the building yeah i don't think as much as i would like to not uh, i'd love to cut the hard line to the building and and there's a lot of days i like to make my cell phone go away right to connect too connected right i mean that's the like we, how like do we, we go can back all identify that? with that for sure yeah how does that phone only go back in the truck i kind of remember those days when the bag phone fed in the truck that wasn't so bad but it's not realistic that we're going to cut away from the cloud, right? There's too much value creation there. Efficiency, traceability, right? We're probably going the other direction. If we look at the demands for traceability and reporting, either sustainability or identity preservation through the supply chain, et cetera, all those things require the cloud. They may require blockchain and, and these other technologies. I know they're not new. They seem new to us, but they're really not. But you get the idea. Those processes are going to happen. And so I think there's probably two, and th these are strategic conversations and they have to occur with people um, like your friend who are really IT experts and cybersecurity experts of one, how do we harden what we have? And then I'm always a guy that likes options. And so how do I have a backup plan? And how do I have a backup plan to a backup plan? So that if something happens, you know, I can still feed the pigs. 
So how do I have an offline system that may not be perfect, it may be hard, but how do I create an offline system to run the feed mill or run an electronic sow feeding system? You know, it's the, the, the row marker and the steering wheel on the tractor, that's the backup. How do I create the backup uh, in my pig systems and uh, I, in poultry and beef, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's our challenge and that's gonna cost some money for both hardening the system and separating the system or having a backup that's separated. So those, uh, those are conversations that we're not gonna fix today. We're not gonna fix tomorrow. There's probably not a short-term fix, but there certainly needs to be a long-term strategy and then some tactics built around that to protect our system so that we can continue to provide you know, animal care that's, that's outstanding. Uh, we, we don't do anything that compromises the welfare of those animals. And so that becomes as you read, they don't eat, that's a problem. And allows us to capture the benefits of technology, which are going to be critical for our competitiveness on the global stage, right? We export a tremendous amount of the product we produce in, in all the meat industries in the dairy business today. And so that means we're our competitors probably aren't down the street. Our competitors are spread out across the globe. And so if we're going to compete globally, uh, we're going to have to be able to adopt those technologies and figuring then that out is going to be part of our mission, not the whole mission, but certainly part of our mission going forward. I want to wrap up kind of out on a tangent here because you mentioned blockchain uh, and, you know, blockchain is kind of so inextricably linked to this idea of crypto, which a lot of us, myself included, maybe just don't quite get. I know a lot of folks get really excited about it. I don't want to talk about crypto, but but look at blockchain what are technologies or concepts like that that you think we really uh, aren't talking about enough in the industry or things that you see coming down the line that could help us move the ball forward that maybe hey we in food animal production and processing and feed production need to be taking a harder look at yeah i, I don't know if i understand blockchain myself so <laughs> i use the word i feel less understand. bad that's good <laughs> yeah I, I mean we try yeah, we've got some projects going in that area, and I'm still not sure I really understand it, except that it's it's all about trust, right? That's how I've distilled that back down of how do we create something that can't be tampered with. So if I say it came from X, I know it came from X. Um, and I and I think our retailers are, are going to expect some of that stuff. There's certainly other approaches that are less elaborate than blockchain that could allow the same kind of approach. It, it, as I look at uh, where is tech got to go and how's the industry going to shape, I, I've looked at the industry and talked to a lot of people over time. And I think if you put this kind of consensus together, we're probably a few years behind Europe, uh, whether we like it or not. And so if you look at that model uh, from a welfare, from a food safety, from a traceability standpoint, from a sustainability standpoint, uh, environmental sustainability standpoint, but those things are probably going to percolate through here. I don't know if we're 10 years or 20 years away, but that's going to happen. So if you look at that, you say, well, we're going to raise fewer animals that each one of them having significantly higher value. That's the European model. And they'll have other attributes, right? Including things like traceability. And so, you know, I think we're going to start looking at those technologies to say, how can we verify to our customer that, and, and by our customer, I, I don't necessarily mean the consumer, I mean the retailer. Mm -hmm. um, so the, you know, the, the Kroger's, Walmart's, McDonald's, Yum's of the world, how do we verify to them that we, A, are doing what we said we're doing, B, we are producing a product that meets their specifications, and, and C, provide some flexibility and adaptability to meet changing consumer demands. And, and I think that's kind of where the future is, right? We, we've, ag's always been a make it and uh, we make it, you buy it. Uh, and I think if you look at Europe, you look at what's happening even here in the US with some of the food chain, right? There's more of a, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna buy what you make. We're gonna buy what we wanna buy. Mm -hmm. That's a bit of a more consumer centric approach, right? And so to achieve that, whether that's blockchain or others, that's gonna require technology and that's gonna require traceability and animal better animal, animal identification uh etc cetera, etc cetera. and then some differentiation in the products of uh, what comes to market and how do we do that and, and you're seeing that already right with organic and, and some of these other you know probably i'm going to call them extreme and that's a bad deal but they're at the fringe of differentiated they're mm -hmm. super differentiated 
but I think you're going to see more of that, right? That uh, we may have products of different attributes coming. And so how do we verify that? How do we produce that? And um, how do we do that in a way that our consumer trusts us? I think we're going to have to do a lot with environment. Big chunk of that's going to be environmental sustainability. I think we're going to have to prove we're lowering our carbon footprint. Um, and it doesn't matter if we like that or not. The consumer is going to tell us, our customer is going to say, no, no, you're going to do that. And so we're in business, right? Um, our job is to produce what the customer wants to buy. And so we got to figure that out. So that's all going to take technology and sensors and integration in the cloud, et cetera. So I think all that's coming. I think it's the next 20 years are going to be just as dynamic as the last 20 and the last 20 have been pretty dang dynamic. <laughs> uh, and so I think we're going to continue down that path and it's, it's pretty exciting, but all of this technology stuff, the cloud security, et cetera, that's all going to come more into, I don't know if it's going to be at the top of our conversation, but it's going to be part of our conversations all of a sudden that, you know, when um, we were getting rid of the horse on the farm and putting a gas motor on there to do it, I don't think anybody envisioned that that's what's going to happen. And certainly there are a lot of farmers today that, that remember that conversion and just think about that, right? Hey, they went from uh, getting rid of the horse to having a motor to now we're talking about how do we do cybersecurity? And that's all going to be a key part of uh, key part of ag. For the latest breaking news in food animal and animal feed production, subscribe to the Feedstuffs Daily e-newsletter. And for our ongoing reporting on this JBS ransomware attack, you can also visit feedstuffs.com. This episode of Feedstuffs in Focus was sponsored by United Animal Health, a leader in animal health and nutrition. You can learn more about United Animal Health and how they're working to advance animal science worldwide by visiting the website unitedamh.com. I'm Andy Vance, and you've been listening to Feedstuffs in Focus. Thanks for joining us today. If you want to hear more conversations about some of the big issues affecting the livestock, poultry, grain, and feed industries, subscribe to this podcast on your favorite platforms, including Apple and Google Podcasts, or check out our website, feedstuffs.com, for future episodes. Until next time, have a great day, and thanks for listening.